Heavenly Father, you are the perfect Father. And we're so thankful for your love, your mercy, your grace, your patience. How you love us, how you guide us, how you instruct us. You're not a mean father. You don't expect us to know things that you haven't taught us, that you haven't showed us. You're patient and caring, but you're firm when that's what's required to help us grow. And we thank you so much. I thank you for all the fathers here. I just pray that you would encourage our hearts to continue investing in our children, even if our children are grown, and that we would not only be there for them, but be praying for them and show them by example what it is to live a godly life. As we turn to this passage today, Lord, we pray that you would, you would help us to understand it. You would help us to be convicted by it, be encouraged by it. We're thankful once again for your word and for another encounter with it. And we pray that you would do the work because it's only you that can do that work in our hearts. And we need you to work in our hearts. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. You may have heard there's several popular songs by the title of True Colors, right? To show the true colors shining through, and we usually use that phrase. And what do we mean by that? Well, when someone shows their true colors, it's that we've gotten beyond the impression that we want to give to others to what is actually inside, to what we actually think, to our true character, or thoughts, and many times it takes a point of crisis to reveal what we have inside, to reveal who we truly are. And so that's when many times we see. And sometimes it can be years and years of thinking a person is one way until you really understand who they are, what they think, and that we see the true colors, truly what they are. You know, one of the worst things about this is that not only can we deceive other people, but we can deceive ourselves. We can be self-deluded so that we don't even know what's inside of us, so that we are even uh, deceived as far as what we really think, where our heart really is. And so today in our passage in John chapter 6, we're going to see Jesus bringing his followers to a watershed moment. If you're not familiar with that phrase, a watershed is if you can imagine a mountain, and when it rains, the tip of the mountain divides the waters that are going to go to this river or to this river, to this valley or to that valley. And it may be that that mountain, the waters that fall that are just a few inches apart, are going to end up miles and miles away, even in different parts of the ocean. And so the watershed is that point of division that sends you one way or another way. And Jesus' words today are a watershed. He has had people following him, a mixed group of believers and unbelievers, and his words now are going to be that knife edge that's going to show people where they really are as they have to make a decision about him and they see which way they are going to go. He brought them to a point of really realizing if they truly believed in Him. So after Jesus' discourse of being the bread of life that we've seen for, for several sermons now, He has talked in this discourse about Him being the bread of life. That means that He is, he is the life giver. He has talked about being from above. He has talked even to the point of saying, he has said that we need to eat his flesh and drink his blood to have life. And we already talked about that before. But these, these types of things that Jesus was saying have brought people to a point of decision. And we have seen as he got clearer and clearer in his teaching that the people misunderstood him. They grumbled about what he was saying and they disputed and today we're going to see that many are going to stop following him. They are going to leave him at this point. But now, it's not the, the ones that initially opposed him that are grumbling and disputing. Now it's his own disciples. 
And so we're going to see how he addresses it when his words have caused a stumbling block to even his own followers. How will he address this? So in today's passage, we see how our disposition towards Christ determines our ability to persevere in following him. And there's two points in our text. By the way, our text is John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verses 60 through 70. And we're going to see first that unbelief cannot persevere in verses 60 through 66. And second, faith cannot quit in verses 67 through 71. So unbelief cannot persevere, verses 60 through 66. And faith cannot quit, verses 67 through 71. So let's go ahead and read our passage. John 6, starting in verse 60, and we'll go all the way to the end of the chapter, which is verse 71. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. So the first point we're looking at is that unbelief cannot persevere. It cannot endure. It cannot continue to the end. Look there with me. In verse 60, it says, When many of his disciples had heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Now remember that we had, just before this, he had been in the synagogue teaching, right? There in verse 59, it says that he was in Capernaum in the synagogue. So it appears that at this point, the crowd has broken up. The big crowd that was there has broken up, and he's left with his followers, his disciples. It says there, when many of his disciples heard it. So now we're not talking about the general crowd that just showed up on this day to listen to this discourse, to hear what was going on. Now we're talking about his disciples. Now, don't thank the twelve, because we saw a little later that he, when it talks about the twelve disciples, the inner um, ring, if you will, even though there was another inner ring, but the twelve was the ones that we know their names of. There was bigger groups of disciples. At one point, we see 70 being sent out, and there was probably more than this. So there was people that they were just followers of Christ. They had followed him. They were traveling along with him, listening to his teaching and learning from him. This is the group that we are talking about now. And it says, this is a hard saying. They were having a problem. This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? It's a hard saying, a demanding teaching, a difficult thing. It's an insufferable word. They're they're getting to the point where as they see what Jesus is teaching, they're having difficulty with it. This This is hard. This is difficult. What part of it is offensive to them? We read about him saying that they needed to eat his flesh and drink his blood. But we talked about how the way Jesus talks, people understood. I'm sure they understood that it wasn't 
physical. When he said, I am the door, they didn't think he was a door. They understood uh, figures of speech and so forth. But the truth that he was teaching about himself was difficult for them. They were having trouble with it. Jesus had shown them they would have to come to him as Lord. They would have to follow and accept things beyond their understanding. Jesus is telling them things that they can't understand. And he's telling them, you need to believe my word. The only way to do that is to believe in him and just accept what he is saying. But now you're putting Jesus above your own reason. Above your own ability to understand. And that's difficult. They would have to believe in his deity. He's saying things that are hard for them. That he is from above. That he is the Lord of life. We saw those, those terms, right? It's, uh, there's deity implied in that. And now, because of the things that Jesus is saying, there's going to be a social cost. Jesus has been talking to the religious leaders and is being rejected at each point. As in Jerusalem, now he's in Capernaum. And it says that he was in the synagogue and it said the Jews were disputing among themselves, the leaders that were there. And now the things that he's saying are scandalous to where if you aligned yourself with Christ, there was going to be a social cost. It wasn't going to be a popular thing after this to follow Christ. And they said, who can accept this? Who can submit to this? Who can obey this? How could they follow these teachings that Christ was teaching them? They see the demands that Christ is making and they shrink back. We need to think about, I need to reconsider this. I've been following Jesus, but now after hearing what he's teaching, I need to think about this. This is hard. This is difficult. And then we see how Jesus responds here in verse 61 and 62. Once again, we don't, we have seen this several times, right? Jesus doesn't run in to to clarify or to soften the message. Look what he says. But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Jesus is saying, if this offends you, well, you better, you better really think about this because you're going to be offended more if you continue. And some of us might think, well, why did he choose the ascension? Because you would think, well, that doesn't sound like something very offensive, that Christ would ascend back to where he came from. At first, when you read that, at least I did, I thought, wow, Jesus, you know, that's not offensive at all. That should strengthen our faith, Right? But you got to understand, the problem they had is they didn't realize that he was God. That's the thing that they couldn't accept. They were having problems accepting the fact that he came down from heaven. So if he went back up to heaven, that would be offensive. Because in their frame of mind, he's a, he's a prophet. He's a good teacher. But he's not God. So this would have been offensive to them. And the reason they're offended is he's a mere man. He's not God. And so that means the things that he is saying are blasphemous. If you don't believe that Jesus is God and you go back and read all these things that we've been seeing in chapter 6, you have to say, oh, this is, this is blasphemy. If, he's, if he is not God, it's blasphemy. And in verse 63, Jesus explains the reason for their unbelief. He says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Belief is not natural. It's not natural for us in our human nature to believe in Christ. We're saying the flesh here. I think what he's talking about is the human nature. He's not talking about the flesh that is, def- that is the source of evil in us. He's talking to unconverted people, just the human nature, their, their natural disposition. And he says it helps for nothing. It's not going to help you to understand my words. Your human nature is not going to help you 
understand what I am telling you. In understanding the words of Christ, which are spirit-giving and life-producing. Are His words life in themselves? No, they're, they're life when you believe in them. When you believe in Jesus, it's spirit-giving because we get the Holy Spirit to dwell within us, right? So that's what it's saying there, that these words are spirit-giving and life-producing. Believing is a work of the Spirit. The Spirit gives life. So he's saying once again, as we've seen him say before, it doesn't surprise me that you don't believe. I'm not taken aback by your unbelief or offended. I expect it. Because the flesh profits nothing. But we see here that even though believing is a work of God, and we're going to see it in verse 64 and 65, we are still held accountable to believe. Verse 64 says, But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus from the beginning, for Jesus knew from the beginning who were those who did not believe and who it was who would betray Him. So Jesus says, there's some of you that don't believe. And he has told them to believe, right? He's holding them. He's saying, you need to believe in me. It's the only way to have eternal life. And he's holding them accountable for it once again. But in 65, he says, and he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted or unless it is gifted him by the Father. And so he's saying, only those that the Father has given to believe are going to believe in me, yet I'm still holding you accountable to believe. The sovereignty of God in salvation does not annul our responsibility to believe. And there's a little more we need to look at in these verses and think about at this point. You would think if anybody would have a successful ministry, it would be the Son of God. Jesus Himself, God Himself is preaching to these people, and yet the majority don't believe. Think about that. It's like many times we expect that we're going to share the gospel and everybody's going to believe it, and it's like, well, Jesus could have had everybody believe in Him, right? But he gives us the precedent. He shows us what's going to happen when you share the gospel. What's going to happen when you talk to people about me. When you proclaim the message of the cross. Most of them will not believe. They did not even believe Jesus himself. This is the norm. Few will believe. Because it's a spiritual work. Salvation and sanctification is a work of God. And Jesus is just proclaiming the message about Himself faithfully. And He's not maneuvering His message based on how people are going to accept it. His focus is on preaching it clearly. So it's a spiritual work. Jesus doesn't feel the burden of making these people believe and trying to persuade them and trying to manipulate them. He simply proclaims the Word. Even when He knows, He knows many of them are not going to believe. He knows who would not believe. And He still does it. So there's a freedom here to be faithful. Many times we get so focused on the results of what we're doing that we don't understand that what God asks of us isn't results. What God asks of us, what He requires of us, is faithfulness. Faithfulness. There's two parts to that. There's two parts to our faithfulness and Jesus exemplifies it here. First, Jesus does not give up. Look at 64b. Jesus knew from the beginning those who did not believe and who it was who would betray Him. Jesus keeps preaching to people that He knows, that He knew as soon as He started talking to them, that they wouldn't believe. And does He say, well, I'm not going to waste my time talking to these people, preaching to these people? No. He keeps preaching to them until they leave. They're going to leave in a moment. And he, up until the last, kept proclaiming the message because that's part of being faithful. He continued speaking the truth. 
Jesus didn't give up. And we shouldn't give up, right? Sometimes we get, well, I already talked to this person or I already shared or, you know, what good is it trying to to tell them about the Lord? But if our object is just to be faithful, we're going to continue to witness, to try. Now, is there a time where we're going to do it in silence because we've already shared the Word of God and they're just going to see our lives like the unsaved wife in 1 Peter 3? where we're going to share the gospel with our lives because we've already spoken and we're not going to continue to nag and and pester people? Yes. But we're to continue sharing the gospel wisely and in love. Jesus not only didn't give up, He didn't give in. He didn't give in. He didn't see that, well, they they don't like this message, so I'm going to soften it a little bit. I'm going to say it a different way. No. When, when Jesus sees that they're having trouble with his message, he doubles down. He goes even further. Oh, you think, you think that's going to offend you? This offends you, what I told you already? Well, just wait until what's coming ahead, because you're definitely going to be offended by that. He doesn't back down. He tells them to count the cost. He's clear about the demands of the gospel. Faithfulness requires a clear and unapologetic message that's given in love. Our Lord doubles down in the face of troubled faith. Why? Because it's only in His words and in a clear message that there's hope. You see, if He waters down the message because they're offended by it, they're not going to be truly saved. They're going to be self-deluded. And so He uses this as an opportunity to give them the truth again. There's only hope in the truth presented clearly. And if they are self-deluded, He wants them to realize that so that they realize they need to believe because they're not in belief at the moment. So verse 66 is the result of this interaction here. Verse 66, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Here's where we see that unbelief cannot persevere. Unbelief cannot help us continue when the cost gets higher and time goes by. And really, this is a turning point to where Jesus' ministry has been getting more and more popular, and after this, it's going to dwindle down. He's going to go from being someone who people were interested in, and there'll there'll be popularity in spurts, but it's going to change after this. It's going to change After this point, it's a watershed moment where he is taking the field, so to speak, and separating the chaff from the wheat. It's the same thing that Jesus did with the rich young ruler, if you remember that, that narrative of that man that came, that prince that came. What must I do to be saved? And he said, well, you need to follow the commandments, which obviously the man hadn't perfectly, but he thought he had. He was self-righteous. And then Jesus gives him a true test. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. The man couldn't do it. He showed him that he didn't have what it it took. He had an idol in his heart. He hadn't recognized Jesus as Lord because this was something that he could not do, that Jesus was telling him to do. A watershed moment. Helping people to see their unbelief. And so look at this verse closely. It says, after this, many of his his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. What is it saying? It's saying that they had left something to follow Christ. They had left their job, maybe their family, the town that they lived in. They had left something behind to follow Christ. And at this point, they turned back to what they had left. They went back to their old life. And it says that they did not follow Him anymore. They did not travel with Him anymore, but rather went back to their life B.C. or before Christ, if you would. Those that follow Christ for wrong motives are likely at one point or another to go back to their old life. 
People can follow for a time and to an extent, but many times the cost is just too high and they realize and they go back. They fall away. We have different kinds of responses that we've seen here in John chapter 6. We saw those that outright reject Christ in the previous section. And now we see those who have followed for a time, but go away. And if you've been in church for any amount of time, you've seen people do this. You've seen people who you thought got saved and were very active and maybe were even in the music or involved in the ministries and and very zealous for the Lord, and after a time, they just left. And they just lived a life completely foreign, completely without Christ, where you would say, I can't believe that. What happened here? And we see that in the parable of the soils, right? There's, there's soils that the seed sprouts and grows, but the sun comes dries it out, or the thorns choke it out. Because it wasn't true faith. It wasn't genuine conversion. So this was the first group. A group that when it came down to it, was characterized by unbelief and fell away. But that's not the only group present, and we're thankful for that, because we're going to see a different group here in verses 67 to 71, and where we see that faith cannot quit. Faith cannot quit. Verse 67. So Jesus said to the twelve, now, you've been following with this, you may not have noticed, but it hasn't mentioned the twelve yet. Twelve as a group has not been mentioned, and that goes back to what, what I've been saying, that the Gospel of John assumes that we've read the Synoptic Gospels, right? And I, I make a point of that, and you might say, why do, why do you keep saying that? Because many modern scholars would set the Gospel of John as contradictory to the Synoptics. That's why I say it. Because it's not contradictory, it's filling in information that the Synoptics have not given us. It's adding to it. And so we see the twelve now addressed as a group And he says to them, do you want to go away as well? Now think of this. They were following Jesus. They've been following Jesus, some of them, uh, since John the Baptist, since the beginning, several years now into this ministry with Christ. They've traveled with him. They know him. They love him. And all of a sudden, things were looking pretty positive. People were following Miracles of feeding the 5,000, all these people going around with them, popularity. Imagine how they felt. They were the inner circle with Jesus, this, for the moment, celebrity. And now, Jesus has said some things that many people stop following and leave. And they're looking around and people are leaving. Can you imagine how they felt? I'm sure they were very discouraged, saying, whoa, what's, what's happening? This isn't what we expected. We expected now to Maybe go to Jerusalem now in the great coronation or something. And remember their expectations of the Messiah. And um, and so Jesus is going to minister to them in this question, right? It's like as if we were in this church and there's just a thriving church here. All of, all the pews are full, and all of a sudden people start leaving. A bunch of people leave, and we're a very small group. Imagine how that would feel. And so he ministers to them. But it's an interesting way that he does. He says, do you also want to go away? Do you want to go away too? Everybody's leaving. You guys want to go too? Now you might think Jesus asking this is maybe like, what's what's he trying to do? Does he want them to leave? The way that the question is phrased in the Greek implies a negative response. So he knows they don't want to leave. Obviously. But he's asking them this. Why? And I think the reason he's doing it is because they're looking at all the people leaving and they're getting discouraged. And he wants to take their eyes off of that and put their eyes back on him where their eyes should be. And it gives them a chance to express their faith where everybody else is with their feet showing their unbelief. He's giving them a chance with their words to express their belief In Christ. And that's what they do. That's what they do. Look at verse 
68. Simon Peter answered him. And just before we look at what he says, Simon Peter is the spokesman, right? We know by his temperament, his personality, he's, he's outspoken. He's not afraid to say what he's thinking. And he is a, the natural leader in the group. And so he speaks out here as a spokesman for them and says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Profound response that Peter gives here. And he continues in verse 69, And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So there's two elements that Peter points out. You have the words of eternal life. So the words, we appreciate the words that you're giving us. And we appreciate you. We know who you are. We're right about you. Whereas unbelief was wrong about Christ. That's what the whole problem with that first group was. Why they left is because they were wrong about Christ. And yet here, he's expressing, we don't understand those words completely, Lord. It's, we might have, you know, I imagine they were thinking, I wish you would have said that in a different way to not drive all these people away. But in spite of that, we know who you are. And so we're not worried about not fully understanding those words because we know you've said that they are words of life and we believe that. He says, where can we go? What else can we do? What are our options, Lord? Are we going to go with the Pharisees? They don't have the words of life. Are we going to go with the Sadducees? They, where else are we going to go? We have nowhere else to go. And you know what? When you're discouraged... When you're doubting sometimes, when you're having a hard time, you need to ask yourself, where else can I go? Lots of times when I feel that way, I ask myself, I think of two things. One thing is, where else, where would I go? Who's going to give me the truth if it's not right here in, in the person of Christ? And secondly, I ask, I ask myself, where would I have been if it wasn't for the work of Christ in my life? Because I know that it wouldn't be a good place that I would be in my life right now had it not been for the words of life. Who else can we follow but Christ? They recognize what Jesus has been saying all along, that His words are the only way to eternal life. But how did the disciples get here? The other group is in unbelief, but how did the disciples get to this belief? Look at verse 69. It says, we have believed. What did they believe? Well, if you look back to verse 63, it says, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. They heard the words of Christ and they believed them. And since they believed them, go back to verse 69, and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. This isn't a knowing like just a factual knowing. He says, you spoke these words, we believed them, we believed in you, and now we have come to know, our eyes have been opened, and we know for certain, experientially, that you are the Messiah, that you are the Son of God. Psalm 34, 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord had good. They had ate and tasted. They had tasted and seen that the Lord was good. And they weren't going to be dissuaded. Genuine faith cannot ultimately, ultimately fail. And you might say, well, hold on. I know that in a few chapters later, Peter's going to deny Christ and all the other ones are going to be scattered and desert Christ. You might say, so you're saying that true faith doesn't fail, but they do fail eventually. But notice that I, I said, does not ultimately fail. Because we can all backslide, can't we? And even though the disciples failed, did they not all come back and serve Christ to the point of even giving their lives for Him? They did. There's a difference between backsliding and deserting. Because if you have truly believed, 
Though you may backslide for a time, the Lord is not going to leave you there. He's going to bring you back. One way or another, and many times that involves discipline. But He won't let you continue living in that way. Finally, we have verses 70 and 71, which are a little bit off, off tone from what we've been seeing. And we'll have to connect that in a second. Simon says this marvelous thing, and you think, well, Jesus is going to say, good job, Peter. Man, that's like he says in another place, right? Flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but God did. But he doesn't say that here. He says, Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Now, verse 71 is a parenthetical statement that's added in there. But what Jesus said was, did I, the only thing he said was, did I not choose you, and one of you is a devil? And it's like, why is Jesus saying this? Why is he saying this to the faithful group, the small group that didn't leave him? And he's telling them this. Well, I think it's a call to self-examination. I think what he's saying here is, you guys should not presume on your faith. Because even in this small group that's still staying with me, that's going to go through a lot more with me, even in this group, there's a person who is not a true follower. And it says there, a demon or a devil. The word in Greek is for slander, right? Because Satan is a slander. And he is going to betray Christ. And this should really make us self-examine because think about that. Every time that Jesus said this, if you think of the, of the Last Supper, they don't have any idea who it is. And you might think, well, yeah, it might be hard to know who it is if, you know, if, if Jesus were to say someone at your church isn't a true believer. It might be hard to, we don't know each other that well. These men traveled together, ate together, ministered together. Ju Judas was sent out. He preached. He did miracles with the 70, remember that? And so he looked just like the rest of them. They never suspect of Judas to the point where when he says one of you is, is a traitor, they start saying, well, maybe it's me. And so that's a call to the fact that we can get that deluded. We can get that deceived and so easily deceived others to where it's not even apparent Judas followed for a long time, but even he eventually fell away in a horrible way. And so even with him, his unbelief did not hold him to the end. Unbelief cannot persevere. And when I say that faith can't quit, I'm not talking about the faith that that's our thing. It's a faith that God has given us. He keeps his own. It's not that we have something inside of us that we can conjure up and, and that's going to get us to the end. I'm talking about the faithfulness of God and that He keeps us until the end. So just to conclude, it's easy to follow Christ when things are going well, when there's no cost, right? Many people were following Christ in that time. Seeing the miracles, it was probably everybody was probably really excited. The feeding of the 5,000, wow, Jesus is feeding us. We're seeing these miracles. It's just amazing. It's easy to follow Christ when there's no cost or when it's going well. But what if today coming to church might have cost you your career or might have cost you your financial stability? Or maybe, because this is happening in countries today, that going to church, meeting with other believers could cost them their life where there's a real cost. Would you still identify as a Christian and follow Christ if that were the case? You know, the churches in, in persecuted countries are much smaller. Because if you're, if you're going to do this, you have to be ready to, to face that cost. 
And therefore, those that there are truly committed. But where would you be if, if that was the cost? And I don't know, maybe you have had a cost to following Christ in your life, and I'm not trying to disrespect that. But we do live in a time where it's fairly easy to identify as a Christian, it's getting harder and harder, or to come to church and be part of this. Maybe you recognize your unbelief and wonder what you can do. Maybe you've been listening and say, well, I want to believe, but you just said that belief is a gift of God, so how can I believe? How can I believe? Well, you can believe. You just believe. You do it. And you ask the Lord, like the man who had the son that was falling into fits, he says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. You cry out to God to give you belief. And he is more than willing to answer that prayer. And maybe you have heard the call of Jesus today as, as we read this, where he's saying, one of you is going to betray me. And you've said, well, I don't have security in my salvation. I don't have that sense of security that I'm one of his. What can I do? There's something that we can all do when we feel that. Superficial Christianity is a breeding ground for self-delusion. And really, when we're not walking at the pace that God wants us, when we're not following Christ as we should, one of the blessings that we're going to lose is a sense of security of our salvation. There's no security when you're backsliding. There's no security when you're lukewarm, when you're cold. So the remedy is to follow Christ. Follow Christ. Follow Christ to the extent that it costs you something and then see what happens. Identify with Christ in a situation where you may lose the respect of those around you. Share the gospel when it's hard for you. Give of your time and your money sacrificially. And if you're not a true believer, if you start doing this, you're going to start having second thoughts. Just like the people in our passage. But if you find yourself enjoying following Christ and counting the cost gladly, you're also going to have a sense of security that you are one of His. What a blessing it is to, to have the words of our Lord that we can look at, right? And I've said it time and time again, preaching the words of Christ is such a, a difficult thing. But it's such a blessing to have to meditate on these words and think about them. And today, Christ calls us to count the cost. As the disciples follow Him from here on, there's going to be a higher and higher price to pay. But they're going to do it gladly, especially after the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, where they are going to suffer even more intense persecution and rejoice in it. May we also be able to do that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the words of Christ. They're a challenge. They're a challenge, Lord. Jesus doesn't soften the message. He says if we want to follow Him, we must deny ourselves, take up our cross daily and follow Him. Help us not to be self-deluded, Lord, to, to kind of dumb down our Christianity to something that we can handle, something that doesn't cost us much, and delude ourselves. Help us to live in a way that honors Christ and that we would be ever more and more decided to follow Jesus regardless of what comes our way and looking forward to the day when we will see our Lord face to face. In His name we pray. Amen.